when disaster strikes. Will you be ready? Good evening, and we begin tonight with the monster hurricane and its deadly impact already. When all hope is gone, will the government be there for you? If you're looking for ways to take your prepping to the next level, then you've come to the right place. Broadcasting from a secure and well-prepared location, it's time for Prepping 2.0. And now, please welcome authors Glenn Tate and Shelby Gallagher. Welcome, everyone, to Prepping 2.0. This is one of your hosts, Shelby Gallagher, and I am joined by my co-host and husband, Glenn Tate. Hello, Glenn. Hello, Shelby. This is a show that I'm excited about. We've uh, we've planned for. This is going to be a good one. This is going to yes. be a lot of practical knowledge. You know, we often talk about uh, stuff, right, like equipment and stuff like that. Well, obviously, the most important thing out there is the human mind, right? Your mind and the mind of people who might want to do you ill. And we have a guest, a fantastic guest, who is going to be able to help us understand some stuff that we haven't ever seen before, probably, and haven't dealt with. And that's Roy. We're just going to use first names. He is a uh, recently retired NYPD detective and an Air National Guardsman, which means he has seen the criminal mind, which is going to be one part thing we're going to talk about. And then that's obviously the NYPD thing. And uh, he's also seen the other half of it, which is the disaster response stuff and how people, quite honestly, freak out uh, during disasters. And so... We're going to equip you via Roy. We're just going to sit back and learn, by the way. I mean, Which that's is what we're our, most of our shows yeah, are exactly. anyway, right? We, just, we sit back and learn and we go, wow, this is really cool. I, 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 we have are a lot of cool guests. Are you taking notes over there? Yeah, yeah. we got some note taking going on. We actually have note taking going on. So anyway, with um, very little further ado, let's jump into the top hundred and this one's a downer go this, ahead and explain why <laughs> so our this is that we take this off of our top 100 list of things that disappear in a collapse you can always find this at our website prepping 2 zero.com in the lower right it's based upon a list that was made from those who survived the bosnian collapse i think that's so important to realize because that was so ugly and so in our recent history, this one's, you know what breaking news glenn tate number 60 Preppers, grab your pen. This is really important. You would have never thought of this. You would have never thought of this one. Canned fruits and veggies and soup. What? Who saw that coming? (laughs) So the thing is the top 100 list, like 99 out of 100 times, it's actually stuff that you go, wow, I never thought of clothespins, for example. I remember that one came up. I was like, clothespins. Oh, that's right. There probably won't be washers and dryers. flashlights, all of that. Canned food. Folks, if you don't don't know that canned food is important as a prepper you're not doing it right yeah yeah go go oh my list, word. stop I listening have, I to can't this show stop laughing i think that's hilarious if you don't think canned food's important stop listening to this show and go find a podcast on bird watching or oh, whatever Lord, so anyway there you go we did that well anyway um shelby we have so many new listeners and by the way we, we welcome we we look at our download numbers not out of a sense of ego or anything but just to keep in touch with what's going on out there huge increases in download numbers amazing we thank every one of you yes. listening and i say download listeners of course there are an unknown number of people who listen on terrestrial radio on the various radio stations we're on we thank you too by the way this isn't just like a podcast that happens to be on the radio this is a show that is on a podcast yes. and on radio so we used to talk a lot about, you know, way back in 2019, you know, way <laughs> back so then. Long ago. Yeah, so oh 2019. Gosh. We used to talk a lot about how people can help get word out about the show. And um, we have something on our website that helps with that. But why don't you tell people how they can help get the word out about the show? Because we think if you're listening, especially with all the coronavirus stuff going on right now, you're probably saying, aha, now is my time to be able to convince people around me that maybe they need to take this seriously. I wish there were a show that was like full of rational people who actually knew what they were talking about and were not tinfoil hat crazies. I wish there were such a show out there that I could uh, suggest people listen to. And of course, that would be our show. But anyway, tell people how they can uh, do this. So easy. Our website is where everything starts from go to prepping 2 zero.com how you can help the show on the kind of again the right hand side to, toward the lower part there's our facebook page there's our patreon page if you want to financially support us it helps us keep all the equipment going and 
um, after this morning, which going to help us get a repair guy. Oh, yeah. my word. Yeah. A um, little bit of a glitch this morning glitch that's been this fixed morning. by Shelby. Not by Shelby. You were you fixed it. You were I fixed it. You were a one woman geek squad, and I pushed out about ten new gray hairs too doing it. <laughs> but yeah, so there's there's Facebook, there's me Miwi, there's there's Spotify, there's all the places you can enjoy our podcast as well as Patreon, where you can come and support us and have access to our after show, which is really a lot of fun. That's the fun. By the way, speaking of after show, we're going to uh, what we we ask Patreons to ask Roy their questions in the after show. And we have 17 questions, some of them with multiple parts. You guys, the good stuff happens That's in the after the show. That's where the taters happen. Now, it's not, it's not like we try to do that. I mean, it's cool that it turns out that way, but we're on, speaking of radio listeners, a hard radio clock. We have hard breaks for the radio world, and that's why we have to cut it off sometimes. Um, and you, you mentioned um, all the places we're on. Obviously, iTunes. That's a oh, big. Oh gosh, yeah, that's a big Spotify. one. Spotify. We came online we just with Spotify. Came on, yeah, and just that's recently. Huge. So you can get this show um, on a variety of things. But you're right, prepping to dash zero dot com, and there are all these buttons you can hit, and you can share us. By the way, not just listening to us. That's cool. That's what we want. We want to get a message out to people. If you would, on whatever platform, YouTube, by the way, there's that. Um, if you would rate, Share it. rate, subscribe, um, subscribe to a channel, rate, comment, give stars, ratings, all that stuff, it drives the algorithms. And let's just say those algorithms are not exactly designed to get prepper messages out. <laughs> and so you can also just listen from our website too by the way yeah exactly so it's all it's all there i wanted to make two quick mentions then we're going to get roy on which is what everyone wants to hear about um continue to have amazing fun and success with the khnc radio show that's a radio station some of you are listening to it right now in colorado as i call it khnc the patriot ten thousand watt flamethrower of truth um, anyway, uh, that's a show that I, I do Fridays. It's just me for an hour. And those archives are on the prepping2-0.com website. That show is a hoot nanny basket of fun. So um, I highly recommend if you like this show, you're going to like that too. Cage Sensei is so cool. Um, quick note, Pam Radio, P-A-M Radio, not ham, but Pam. That's prepper, amateur, uh, ham radio practical knowledge flashcards so oh my gosh, close it to being hurts. done it's, it hurts it hurts it hurts so close to being Every, done and you guys are emailing us you're you're we sending hear you. we hear you we and know we you keep, want them and it's and i almost want to say i'm going to speak for our fans we talk a lot about it <laughs> yeah i'm just not seeing any results <laughs> not seeing anything here we hear you we know it's it, just when we think we're done there's another little hurdle there's another little something right amazing software developer um i'll call him the fry guy uh you know what i'm t you know who i'm talking to there mr fry guy and um it's it's been great we keep adding goodness to it which means it's taken slightly longer to get out but we're going to get it done right I thought soon. it would be done in February. We're now in March. Really, really soon. It's going to be great. It'll be a great 4th of July. A great 4th of <laughs> July. That's right. It's free. It's an app on your phone, and it's all the practical stuff about ham radio that you need to know from a prepper perspective. None of the technical stuff. It's not a, a test prep. There's no Morse code. There's no ionosphere. There's no equations, because guess what? I'm terrible at all that stuff, and I don't even care. What I want to know is how to talk to my dudes and the neighborhood, and that's pretty much what you're going to find out. I think this will be really big in the prepping world because no one's done it before. Not because it's like I'm brilliant, and what I have to say is brilliant. It's like somebody needed to get this information yeah. out. Happened to be me and Fry Guy. Thank you, sir. So that's all good. That is all good. Well, I wanted enough stuff. Enough stuff. Let's let's talk to Roy. Um, Roy, I don't let him tell you a little about himself, but I'm going to give you a, a bit of a preview because he's probably a pretty humble guy and he's not going to like say some stuff. So I have to like be unhumble for him. Um, former, uh, I'll say retired, recently retired um, uh, NYPD detective, where you're obviously going to learn a ton of stuff about scumbags and dirt bags and all of that other stuff, and also. A, uh, a retired Air National Guardsman and did some disaster work. So, Roy, with that, why don't you tell folks any other stuff about you, and let's see if they can guess what part of the country you're from. <laughs> all right. First of all, two words that have never, a few words that have never come out of my mouth is a 
hoot nanny basket of fun. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds weird when you, you say it. Many, you don't hear many of us say that. No. No, that's right. <laughs> oh, goodness. I try to make up one word right, or second, phrase. Second of all, all right. I uh, okay. just want to add, I started in the United States Army where I first started out, so I was just always an international guardsman. So I did active duty first and the NYPD uh, graduate, you know, and then also Air National Guard, uh, which is a rescue wing, a 106 rescue wing out of West Hampton, New York, uh, home of the Jolly Green Giant uh, PJs. PJs. Love those dudes. So, yeah, so that's okay. what you've done. That's right. So the first topic, unless you have other stuff to tell us. No, go ahead. No, okay, cool. Um, the first topic we're going to cover is something you and I have spoken about quite a bit, and your thoughts were influential um, in writing the 299 Days book series. Now, in all candor, I wrote some stuff, and then I talked to you, and I found out I was right. <laughs> I, didn't know, I didn't know I was right going into it. And that's about the criminal mind and, and the and the reference to the book I'll make. And you can talk about anything you want, you know, war stories, anecdotes about the criminal mind. But just kind of frame things up. In the book, I talk about 1%, 3%, and 10%. And there's approximately 1% of the population that are just cold-hearted, evil people that have zero remorse. And, you know, if, if conditions were perfect... They'd be out killing people for fun. And by the way, my, my percentage numbers might be off, but whatever. It illustrates the point. Then there's about 3% that uh, do everything they can right up to the point of getting caught. I mean, they'll go and commit crimes, but if they think they might get caught, uh, it's like 50-50. Maybe they do it. Maybe they don't. But they're very calculating. And when there's enough force brought against them and there's enough chance of getting caught, they probably won't do it, but boy, you turn your back for a second and there they are doing bad stuff. Then there's about 10% of people uh, that are what I call, and I, I, I don't know if this is descriptive enough, they're sort of the workers' comp scumbag scammer guys. And they're in peacetime, they're the ones that will um, buy a TV and when they're taking it home, they trip and they fall and the TV breaks and they take it back and they say, hey, this TV's broken. I mean, and they're kind of mild scamsters however when there's no law and they think there's no accountability that 10 percent really kicks into action and it's not just broken tvs now it's like hey i took all your food because i thought it was a good idea so anyway just to give people a framework so tell folks because people out there listening i'm gonna guess are not criminal scumbag thugs i'm just gonna go ahead and guess that we have zero of those in the audience so Describe the criminal mind, describe how they act, what they look for, because you saw it all as an NYPD detective. So tell folks what they need to know about the criminal mind. Well, what I'm going to start off with is I think your numbers are pretty good. You know, it could be, you know, up or down either way. But that's in when nothing is going on. That's normal everyday life. Everything's going good. There's no, you know super pandemics, you know, the government's not shut down. I mean, most people, you're right, you know, there's people out there that's going to commit crimes regardless. Uh, the group I'd like to talk about is the group that are the criminals in when they think they have the opportunity. You're saying 10%. I'm going to go a lot higher than that. Uh, I'm going to go like 25% of Good. the population. If they think they can get away with something, they will. If it's as simple as, oh, I went to the store and they forgot to ring up this $50 item and they're going to leave with it and they're not going to even think twice about it. They're just going to walk out the door and say, ha-ha, my lucky day, I got you. Home Depot or Lowe's or Target or whatever it is, you didn't ring this up and I got away scot-free. Because people will do that. Uh, those numbers go drastically up in case of actual emergencies. Uh, after 9-11... Uh, I was a first responder, ground zero worker. I was always on the pile, but I had friends that were working in the outlying boroughs. And crime did go up during that time because they knew the majority of the police officers were busy tending to the rescue efforts, and a lot of the petty crimes went up. And that was isolated to Manhattan. Hmm. Uh, when we get to a scenario like we had Superstorm Sandy or one of those other you know, natural disasters, those numbers went way up. I mean, you have friends and neighbors stealing generators from each other because they didn't have one. Uh, you know, you can ask more specific questions if you want, but I've seen those numbers rise drastically because 
somebody wanted something that you had, they knew law enforcement was busy doing something else, they knew there was no repercussions that was going to happen, so if they thought they could get away with it, they went ahead and did it. Yeah, here's a question for you. How pervasive, and again, people listening don't probably have experience with people like this. How deep-rooted and pervasive is it, this idea that I, I'm just going to take whatever I want, you know, the world owes me, you know, just like get out of my way. I'm all about taking stuff from me, right? I mean, because again, it's hard for people to relate to this. So, I mean, how how deep-rooted is that? <laughs> all right, you're touching on the area. Uh, you know, I don't want to, uh, this is not racist or bigoted. I'm not going to uh, say any race is involved, but in low poverty areas where people are used to getting services for free, whether it be housing or food stamps or welfare or women and infant care, WIC as we call it in New York, uh, they do have a big sense of entitlement that stuff should be free for them, uh, especially if those services are not available because of computer malfunctions or natural disasters. They have a mentality that they should still get it for free and they have no problem in their thinking that, well, if you have it, I get it for free, I'm just going to take it from you. And I've seen that over and over again. And I, I can, and we've had, we've had plenty of conversations offline. I know you don't think this is a racial thing. You've, you've maybe seen it. I'll tell you this, out here in rural western Washington, I've seen plenty of, of white people who have the same approach and attitude. I've been... A judge I've sat there in the courtroom I watch him come in I watch him hang out I see him in the hallway and virtually everybody's white where I live and it's the same it's the same mo right it's the same mindset different skin color so you're cool on that nobody nobody thinks you know you're a bad person and, for and, that and, kind and of stuff and it's not all minorities I just no. happen to work in a in a, in, in a minority neighborhood uh, I worked in Brownsville East New York and bed in Brooklyn uh, but I also see it, like I said, when we had natural disasters, I am in a predominantly middle class neighborhood out on Long Island in New York, and we are about 90% white out here. Uh, but I've seen my own residents and neighbors act the same way when these situations occur. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. One of the great conversations we had a number of years ago, I still remember it, you were describing how hardened criminals select victims and what they look for, because this is obviously stuff that the good people listening, they don't want to exhibit this behavior because they don't want to come up on the radar screen of a, of a criminal or a pack of criminals as you know vulnerable. So describe how bad guys pick out victims. Oh, well, I mean... It depends on what crime they're committing, but usually it's the people that they perceive to be unprepared and or weak. Uh, there is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard for me to describe exactly in which context, but if somebody wanted to rob your house and they look at your house and there's no lights on, they obviously know you're not home because your mail is piled up, and then your neighbor could not be home, but he's taken the precautions, has sensors on, lights going on, has somebody picking up his mail or stops his mail. The perception is one house is occupied, the other house is vacant. But in reality, both houses, the occupants are on vacation. It's, it's how you portray mm -hmm. yourself to the public that these hardened criminals pick up on. I mean, they have a sixth sense for literally preying on the weak and the unprepared. Well, I'm going to jump in here, Roy. There was an episode that I did. Gosh, it's been, if you're if you're a newbie, go way back in the archives a, a whole whopping year ago. I did a great show with um, Beth. Um, she's from Pretty Loaded. It's a women's um, self defense organization. We dig deep into as a woman, as an individual. I wouldn't even say woman. Um, a situational awareness. Keep your eyes up. Meet, oh, every, absolutely. meet everyone's eyes when you when you lock eyes with someone you're not going to most likely be a victim because they know you're aware um, yep. look around at those people and she gives a great example and I wanted to see what your thoughts are about this like going into a coffee shop 
And there's people that are just lingering. She And I remember, never forget, she said, Shelby, how much time do you have to linger? I said, I don't have time to linger. I go in and I get my coffee and I might, you know, read a package and leave. She said, those lingering people are not lingering. They're studying. They're looking. They're looking for potentially a victim, somebody to, you know, pick their pocket or whatever. So I want to, what are your thoughts? And especially women. And I don't think the guy population out there understands it. There are all these little micro, what I call micro battles that I do when I'm in public with men. They look at me and I stare back and I give them that resting mean woman face. And they and you know what I'm talking about? And nah. then they look away. But they are looking at me because then they'll come up and do the hey, how you doing? And and I'm like, uh, bye. I don't want to talk yeah. to I don't want to talk to you. I don't I don't want to create this cuz once you have a conversation with someone, it creates a false sense of friendship, a false sense of relationship, and that's where I think women and honestly teenagers and children get themselves into trouble. I don't want to have a conversation. I want I don't want this person to think they can create this false relationship with me and I'll stare them down. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think you're absolutely right about that. You know, what you said situational awareness is huge. Uh, you know, you, your head. You know, your head doesn't have to be on a swivel, but you're you're observing your surroundings, and the criminals will pick up on that. They'll say, "Okay, this person is probably looking around. They're probably going to remember me. They could give a description of me to the police." But you have somebody who's not paying attention, head buried in their phone, yep. sending text messages or selfies. Uh, you know, they're an easy easy pickings because the criminal can go up take what they want, steal from them. You know, even like you said, women, uh, you know, you put your pocketbook down, you're staring at your phone, somebody's watching, you not pay attention. It takes nothing for them to walk past, scoop, scoop the pocketbook up and run out the door. You have no idea who that person just was. Uh, and I agree with you 100%, it's situational awareness. As far as, you know, uh, striking conversations, I'm always friendly to everybody. You know, I look everybody in the eye and I say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where I am. But that's as far as the conversation goes. I acknowledge them that they know, you know, I know they're there. But I, like you said, I'm not striking up conversations with total strangers. You know, I'd be polite. And if I have to after that, I'll say, listen, you know, I don't have time or I'm not here to talk and to go about my business and I leave. Yeah, and I've experienced that, um, and it's different. Obviously, I'm not a woman. By the way, Shelby gets much less of this attention when I'm around for some weird reason. <laughs> but um, um, I'll sit there, and and I don't know how else to describe it. It's just just friendly and everything. And or I'll see I'll see guys, even ones I'm not really concerned about. I'll just kind of do that little that little thing where you pop your head up, and it's like, hey, how's it going? And it just it lets them know I'm engaged. Um, I'm not afraid. And I'm not like pulling a gun out and sticking it in their face. In fact, I've never actually done oh, that to anybody. <laughs> but um, And I'll tell you this, speaking of guns, and we're going to wrap it up here in a moment and go into uh, segment two real quickly. Speaking of guns, when I am carrying concealed, which is all the time in public, um, I have a demeanor. I can't even put my finger on it. Other people have observed it and noticed it. I am way more relaxed. I am way more confident. aware at the same time. Yeah, confident because something goes down it's like seriously come on do we really need to do this it's not hey i have a gun i'm gonna go be like george zimmerman and like go enforce law none of that at all i'm just like in a better place and i think people can see it so we have about 15 seconds what we're gonna do is hold that question over to the next topic or the next segment and we're gonna come back with nypd detective and air national guardsman roy We'll be right back with more of Prepping 2.0 with authors Shelby Gallagher and Glenn Tate right after this. When the grid goes down, darkness will descend fast. Used to be there was nothing you could do about an EMP, electromagnetic pulse, or CME, coronal mass ejection. Now you can protect your electronics, protect your family, thanks to EMP Shield. EMP Shield invented a simple to install device that prevents whatever's connected to it from frying in an EMP or a CME, and it costs just a few hundred dollars. EMP Shield has been tested by independent laboratories and passed muster with the government, which has ordered lots of them. Google EMP Shield and see for yourself and save some money. Get a $50 discount per device. Go to prepping2-o.com. Click on the Friends and Affiliates page, then click on the EMP Shield logo. At checkout, use coupon code PREPPING2.0. It's all one word. Prepping 2.0 is about that next level of prepping. One of the key 2.0 items to have is bulletproof body armor plates. 
I used to think body armor was too tactical for a regular guy like me, but it isn't. Give yourself, your family, and your team an unfair advantage when bullets are flying. Body armor used to be expensive and hard to get. Not anymore. KD Armor, and that stands for come and take it, makes solid and affordable body armor for normal people. Get body armor while you can. The clowns in Congress are trying to prohibit future sales. KD Armor is the place to get it. C-A-T-I armor.com. Prepping 2.0 listeners get a 10% discount when you use the coupon code GRANT. PrepperNet, where preppers unite. Looking to meet other like-minded people in your area? Looking to start your own prepper group? Already have a group? Join PrepperNet.com. PrepperNet has gathered the biggest names in the industry to help unite preppers everywhere. Join John Jacob Schmidt, Scott Hunt, Dr. Bones and Nurse Amy, Glenn Tate, Shelby Gallagher, Charlie Hogwood, Samuel Culper, Survivor Jane, Rick Austin, Franklin Horton, Ryan Mitchell, and Brian Duff. Our team is united. Check us out at PrepperNet. Dot com. PrepperNet, where preppers unite. PrepperNet.com. Shelby Gallagher here. We found that you need to layer your food preps. Yeah, this is Glenn Tate here. A lot of times the hardest part of layering is the long-term foods. We love new mana foods, which have a 25-year shelf life and are non-GMO. Also, organic meals are available. New mana comes in family-style portions and in bulk. This is not backpacking food. It's family meals that last for at least 25 years. The perfect freeze-dried part of your food layering. You can get a sample of Numana meals for $19.95 and see for yourself. You will be amazed. Prepping 2.0 listeners get a 10% discount by entering the code PREP. Go to Numana.com or click the link on the Prepping 2.0 website. Give it a try. Numana.com. That is N-U-M-A-N-N-A.com. And we're back with more of Prepping 2.0 with authors Glenn Tate and Shelby Gallagher. Welcome back, everyone. Shelby Gallagher here. Um, so we wanted to give uh, Roy this question um, so that and give him lots of time to it, because then we're going to I want to fold this into kind of talking about the after effects of Sandy, which he was on the ground, boots on the ground for. So, Roy, hard hitting question here. Are criminals dumb? <laughs> All right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to say most criminals are. Uh, and the reason I'm saying that is because most crimes are the, or the, the, the lower petty crimes where uh, people are, are they're crimes of opportunity. Uh, so those people are not thinking out. They're just impulsive and they're acting and they're committing the crime. There are other criminals that are brilliant. And if I have a minute, I'll, I'll share a quick sure. story. Sure, please do. Okay. Uh, it was Christmas, Brooklyn, uh, mid nineties, ninety six, ninety seven, around here sometime. Uh, big shopping area called Pickin Avenue. They do millions of dollars worth of business. Uh, Christmas shopping. Uh, gentlemen, security guard sets up at the local bank, Banco Popular Dollar, and uh, he has a, a security van, a safe in the back of the van. He's in full uniform, and as the business owners came to put their night deposits in the drop box, he would approach them and say, listen, the lock box is broken. Uh, the bank has, has me out here. I can take your deposits if you want. I have a safe in my van, professional looking setup he had. And, but he didn't force them. Most of the business owners didn't want to be carrying around 30, 40, $50,000 in cash. So they put the money in his safe and he gave them a receipt and they went on their business. The next morning, when nobody had deposits in, they called the bank. Well, the bank's night deposit box was never broken. What he did is he put a key in, snapped the key off, so nobody could use it. And then everybody voluntarily gave him their money. Hmm. So now the gentleman, dressed like a security guard, didn't forcibly take anything from anybody. Everybody gave him their property over willingly. He didn't hurt anybody. And when it came to a description, they said it was a security guard in a security van. And he got away scot-free with an estimated three-quarters of a million dollars on one night. Wow. He's living it big in Bahamas right now, right? (laughs) Jeez. Yeah. But now that is a very smart criminal. Yes. So so you have both types of criminals. Uh, You know, to this day, I, I love telling that story because I'm like, this guy was a criminal genius. Didn't hurt anybody, minimal, 
you know, work for him to do it. People voluntarily gave him all this money, and he made a clean getaway. And, you know, and it, also this was, you know, mid-90s, so it wasn't the security state we have now with everybody having cameras and, you know, small cell phones to get a picture of him. Right. But that was a criminal that was very smart. Oh, wow. You know, Shelby and I have a guilty pleasure in life, and what we love to do is we watch Cops, right? The show where they go around and <laughs> yeah. they, they catch people, and and it's the same thing over and over again, but we, we take so much delight. And obviously, these are the ones that get on TV, so these because are the ones hilarious. that are funny they really and stuff are like that, yeah. so I'm not saying this is science. But over and over again, you know, a guy will have a bunch of dope in the pocket of his jeans. And what does he always say? It's not my those, pants. Those aren't not my, my pants. pants. Not my pants. Not, not my, my pants. pants, not my card, not my backpack, not my socks, not my shoes, oh. not my, right? Exactly. Yeah. So there are dumb ones. I heard it a million times. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Every cop I know has told me they like, lie. how quickly uh, they're on the force like two days and they're rookies. Yeah. And it's like, yep, I got my first that's not my pants thing. So, I mean, they're they're dumb in a sense, but you're right. They're smart in a sense. And I think that when when stuff collapses and there's either less rule of law or there's no rule of law a lot of smart people who have smart um white collar jobs now i don't know accountants just making that up are gonna maybe since there's no accounting to do there there are no tax returns that need to be done anymore they're gonna go into you know smart white collar kind of ripoffs with maybe limited force and the guy you were mentioning you know the fake security guard there could be all the kinds of that stuff because don't forget the population will is currently basically trusting of people and they will be basically trusting of people it'll take them a while to lose that right and Absolutely. so then they're going to be guys doing the kind of stuff you did so this is why we were so excited to have you on it's this understanding this criminal mind and getting yourself out of your nice little world of of decent people and all of that. And Shelby has a question, I believe. So th and this is a great seg I, segue into... I just want to say one thing sure. before Please we do. go off that. Uh, the, the criminals, though, it doesn't take them a few days to adjust like it does normal nice people. They will take advantage of that situation instantaneously. They will immediately. Immediately. Lights go off. They're full out. Wow. So that, uh, that that's an even better Perfect. segue. You, um, Hurricane Sandy... Hurricane Handy hit, hit uh, New Jersey. Gosh, it's been like 10 years now, hasn't it? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 2008, maybe even more. So you were there, boots on the ground. We on the West Coast heard about it. It came across, you know, it came on our five o'clock news every night. It was devastating. We saw that, but it wasn't obvious. It, it wasn't here and present like it was for you. Give us kind of a quick summary of what, what your experience was. And this is what I want to talk about. How quickly, how, how quickly, how efficiently, how criminalized people became in that aftermath. Uh, well, I'll, I'll start off. You know, it hit New Jersey, but where I am on Long Island, it hit us too. And it was just a combination of a perfect storm. High tides, full mood, you know, the high pressure. It just flooded a whole bunch of uh, coastal areas. So we were out with power instantly. Some places had no power for a week, two weeks. But it, it was a, a very big national disaster. People lost homes. I mean, it was horrible. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm going to say about the criminal mind, though, it didn't take long for them to start small crimes. Uh, obviously, the drug addicts instantly, as soon as the power went out, started hitting people's cars, uh, you know, looking for unlocked doors, stealing change, whatever people had left in their cars. You know, on a normal day, people would stay away from that, but now they know that the, the cameras were off. Uh, you know, lights aren't working, spotlights aren't on. That happened overnight. That was literally hmm. the next day. People were getting up going, oh my God, they robbed my car in the middle of a, a storm. Uh, and about the second day of no electricity, no power, and you know, most services, uh, then we had neighbors stealing neighbors' generators. Uh, you know, Tom and Jane next door, the nicest people in the world uh, that you thought of, all of a sudden, you know, they were without. So the husband went down the block and stole somebody's generator that was shut off for the night. That became quite frequent. Mm. Wow. After about the third day, people were literally, we had, we had one right up the road from me. We had a stabbing over gas at a gas station. We had one gas station that had a generator uh, big enough to, to pump the fuel. Uh, there was line down the block, a mile long of cars. One guy came in, one guy thought he cut the other guy, and these are normal, normal people. 
these are not criminals. This is this is a, a very good middle class neighborhood. We had a stabbing because somebody thought that he got cut in line, and that was only after three days. And you know, people really were on edge. And then neighbors started to get frightened of other neighbors. Uh, it was almost unimaginable the way yeah. people acted. So, and let me throw this out here too. So, so those are those are kind of the you know your average people and your average criminals. So, but in all in that though too, was there a layer of those who the smart criminals, the ones that are like, all right, so hmm, were they? Oh, oh absolutely. Absolutely. You had, you know, you had a lot of the, the, the I'm going to say the lower level criminals picking up their game because huh. now, uh, you know, you could have places like you know, the local CVSs and the liquor stores and, you know, any place they could get alcohol and drugs became a to try to break in because there was no, hmm. you know, alarm system. Sure. There was no, you know, lighting, like I said. And so we had incidences of, you know, those type of burglaries where normally you wouldn't, you know, a, a, a meth head wouldn't try to walk into, break into a CBS to steal drugs. But now since the power is out and police resources are elsewhere, all these other types of crimes started happening. So, you know, all the, all the different layers of criminals started stepping up their gains to the next level. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, crackheads and stuff like that. And what, what, lev- uh, what role or what, I don't know, problem does drug addiction um, have going on here? Because, yeah, well, just tell me, I mean, what what effect is, and, and we're talking illegal drugs, but we could also talk about legal drugs too, like, you know, antidepressants and stuff like that. What role did drugs have in all of this? Well, I mean, it's, it's a huge role. Uh, when they can't get their drugs, they become very, very dangerous. And I don't care if you're on meth, crack, uh, you know, a, a housewife on an antidepressant, or even an alcoholic. When they go through their withdrawals, the violence comes out even more. Yeah. Now, you can't trust a meth addict, a crack addict in today's society. They get 10 times worse in their behavior once law and order break down. Uh, it's, and there's it's no one to control them. There's, there's no like, oh, let's put them in a cell and let them detox. That's Nobody gone. has guns in New York. And no offense, Roy, you're a huge Second Amendment guy. I love that. And I'm not ripping on your state or anything. I'm just saying it's a factor when nobody, as a practical matter, has guns. Maybe they do, and I don't know about it. I mean, what role does that have, a, a largely disarmed population? Well, you know what? When you say largely disarmed, New York, New York does have some horrible gun laws. I'm going to say that right now. But... <laughs> If you come out to the outlying counties, uh, anywhere, Long Island, upstate New York, everybody has guns. Okay, good. It's only Manhattan, the boroughs, that they are disarmed. Uh, oh, good. You would have, you, yeah, you would, have, you would have a, New York has the largest ever mass disobedience when we were supposed to register our... That's right, uh, I remember that. So-called I do ...so-called assault weapons. Uh, they estimated there were six million or so assault type weapons in New York State, and they would not release the numbers <laughs> through state police of how many people actually registered, but it was under a hundred thousand. Right. So there are, you know, five point nine million New Yorkers who are became criminals because they decided not to follow the law to register their firearms and. You know, even possession of one thirty-one magazine can be a felony. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so Virginia, you're take a lot note, of people right? Read between the lines and said, "Uh, uh-uh, I ain't telling them nothing, and we're not doing it." That's awesome. You were telling me a story about Sandy that I found, you know, mesmerizing, and it was the description. I think it was a lady you mentioned who was just freaking out on you guys. She's not a criminal; she's just a regular person. And and I don't know. I hope I'm uh, reminding you of the story. Uh, we haven't spoken about her in quite some time, but. Tell that story about her freaking out on you guys and just demanding that FEMA show up with stuff like right now. Yeah, I, 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 I kind of remember that. We were, uh, I was working with the National Guard and we were at a local town hall. And uh, what we were doing, we were uh, handing out MREs, uh, boxes of MREs. And we had one lady who was just demanding, demanding, you know, belligerently demanding that she get services and she needs more water. 
So just out of curiosity, I told, I said, listen, you know, pop your trunk for me and I'll put the MREs in the back. She popped her trunk and in the back of her trunk were already cases of MREs from different places oh, man. that were handing out the supplies. Wow. So I went off on her and so did some of the other troops I was with because she was hoarding relief supplies that were meant for other people. But you're right, you know, and I do remember Lee, you were talking about, but she was a little bit, that she was different. But I'm, <laughs> wanted to segue onto this because now you have somebody who's a normal you know person one of your neighbors but now she's relief is on its way but she feels that she's entitled to more so she had like five or six cases of MREs in the back of her car so she obviously hit up numerous relief locations so that was less supplies to go to somebody else like me or you and those type of people are going to be out there too they're going to you know Hoard. Now, us preppers don't have to worry about that. We're prepared. We have our stuff for our family. But there's going to be people taking services and goods that should be distributed evenly to everybody else. Wow. It's just the fact of life. And that story is one of the reasons we love having you on the show because uh, no one's ever seen that. No one in our listening audience has ever said, hey, ma'am, pump your tr- or pop your trunk. And there's a bunch of MREs in there. I mean, you've seen this kind yeah. of stuff. And again, this was yeah. like a good, decent, normal person in peacetime who was just freaking out. And, and Shelby and I have a theory, and we did a show about this. It was one of the first 10 episodes um, about why people who are unprepared go so nuts in these situations. And one of our theories is people who aren't prepared right now, and this is especially true with the coronavirus stuff that's going on, they know at some level they need to be prepared, and they put it out of their minds, and they put it out of their minds, and they go back to Netflix and wine and kids' soccer games and all that other stuff, and they occupy themselves with. And then then when something hits, all of a sudden, all that, I don't know if it's guilt, I don't know what it is, but that acknowledgement in their mind that they've been putting on some other sector of their brain, and now it's coming out. They're like, geez, I really need all this stuff, and then that leads to it leads to it too yeah. maybe she was going to sell it for all we know but i mean it's that psychology and, and we deal with people that seem normal now they're not going to yeah. some percentage i should be more precise some percentage are not going to be normal in these kind of situations what do you think about that idea about people have a pent-up understanding that they need to prep and they don't and then it all comes flowing out when the helicopters show up with mres and now it's time to you know stock up that basement now right Oh, absolutely. Well, I could, I could tell you to this. Everybody that that thought they should have prepared before, after Hit Sandy was over, everybody went out and bought generators <laughs> after the fact. Good. You know? so they should. You're right. People people think that they, they you know, they get, they feel guilty that they weren't prepared. And then after the emergency is over, they do go out and buy all these supplies, which are probably, you know, generators probably not been started in 10 years, you mm-hmm. know. But they, they do it after the fact because they felt guilty, and I absolutely agree with that assessment. Now, as a prepper, when CAD hit, I wasn't affected at all. I didn't even have to go into any long-term preps. My normal supply of food in the house was good because I just don't have stuff for three days. I have about a month's worth of food in my regular cabinets. As far as I had a generator... I had an ample supply of gasoline, and even when the stations weren't pumping, people, if you don't think outside the box, you're going to get doomed. I live on the water. There are thousands and thousands of boats. Every boat has gas in it when it's stored for the winter. I I never had a problem filling up my car. Other people did because they weren't prepared and didn't have a mindset to think outside the box. Exactly. That's exactly it. And and that's... That's was one of my questions I was going to ask you. I think you answered it. The now that San, when Sandy was done, did people actually take on somewhat of a prepping mindset and they learned their lesson? But it sounds like it was kind of half, checking a box. Yeah, oh, checking, I got a generator. I, I got good. a generator. Check the box. They they didn't bring well, with it. Yeah, I, I think I, I think a small percentage actually <laughs> did start thinking about it because I know a couple friends that actually did, and they still continue to this day have their emergency supplies. I think a lot of the other people just were just need jerk reactions. Well, if the power goes out, I want to have a generator handy. And that mindset went out the window after a year, just sort sure. of like all the patriotism died in the country two years after 9-11. So here's a question for you, and, I, and I'm looking at, I'm, I think I'm going to give you enough time for this, this eight minutes um, that we have before we got to wrap up and go to the after show. But my, my, my thoughts are on this. I'm going to kind of try to combine the two 
topics we have the criminal mindset and after a, after you know kind of a collapse scenario what in terms of the criminal mind how how I don't know how to ask this there's this criminal mind aspect that where the rules go away all right I, I want this food I want this resource I want this whatever and and I think that's where we as preppers and we as decent human beings get caught up and it's kind of the warrior mindset I have this I have this threat coming to me drop the rules the criminal already has dropped all the rules the whole so you're talking about good people dropping the good rules. good people need yeah. to drop the rules because the criminals haven't what are your and I and I think in a collapse it gets ten times worse than that. What are your thoughts on I, that? No rules, I, no I, rules of engagement. I agree one hundred percent. I I didn't have that problem after Sandy. <laughs> you know, my guard was up, and the way I carried myself and behaved in public totally changed. I you know, not I'm not a nice person, but I wasn't going to be somebody else's sure. victim because I know for a fact that the minute the criminals sense an opportunity, they're going to take it. Powers out, natural disaster. God forbid, coronavirus, whatever it is, they know instantly and they react instantly. They step up their game right then and there, where other people, normal, law-abiding people, will continue on their way until they get burned a couple times or something happens to them personally. And I see it over and over and over again. Everybody needs, when it's a national, when, it, when it is a disaster, you have to step it up. You have to change your mindset instantly because the criminal element has already done it. So where you might give somebody, you know, a second chance or, uh, you know, be nice, help yeah. out stranger, you know, oh, listen, my car broke down and my, you know, my son is back at the car and he has no water. Can you spare some food or water? If it's that big of an emergency, no, I cannot. This is for me and my family. I'm sorry, I have nothing. You need to go away. Where most of the time people say, okay, and then that person comes back mm -hmm. and then they come back with two or three other people because they know you now have it and they don't and they want what you have. Exactly. We had uh, a couple guests on that talked about gangs. Uh, they were law enforcement guys that were familiar with gangs and one of them, um, Officer Mack, he specifically asked uh, a, a high level um, uh, leader of the New Mexican Mafia um, which, by the way, is the name of a gang. It's not like some put down to Mexicans or anything like that. It's the name of a gang. I'm sure they have them in New York, too. And so and ask this guy, like, what happens when the lights go out and there's no law enforcement? And the gang leader was just very matter of fact. He said, well, we're going to we're going to control the gas stations and we're going to control the water treatment, the water distribution. And if you want yeah. something, you come through us. Th my point with this is the gangs, which is not what we're talking about, but it's obviously a thing. The gangs have already planned this out and they're going to instantly recruit all these, you know, 1%, 3%, you know, you were talking mm -hmm. about 25%. Those are going to be the foot soldiers and they're going to be out there doing that. You know, one question I have, and this is a, a real curveball for you, but let's see, let's see what happens, right? This is the beauty of, of this show. Sure. Um, I have a theory that uh, feminism has destroyed America. We only have four minutes, so we're not going to talk about that. But I have a theory that a lot of men, and I used to be this way, so this is why I can relate, have been feminized, um, got out of that. Obviously, Shelby is an enabler of masculinity, which I love. I mean, it's like, yeah, be a man. This is good. This is great. She appreciates it. So I think yeah. a lot of people regular kind of suburban people and this isn't a rip on the east coast i mean this is just as true you know in Everywhere. any part of the country because it's a national yeah. problem this this feminism and i can just see this and i and i have a couple characters in the book where this plays out chloe and todd um are two characters but it's like the the peacetime feminism that some women and i'm going to generalize here but i don't care because it's an important point so you can get mad anyone listening can get mad at me don't really care some women are going to hold the old peacetime feminist views that men should never fight, men should never protect, men shouldn't be, quote, macho. I hate that word. Um, and then it's going to get a lot of people killed. You know, you were talking about the example like, oh, hey, you know, my uh, my son needs some water and stuff like that. I could see, again, generalizing some women saying, you know, Harold, go help him. And Harold's like, this is dumb. But Harold's like, well, I don't want to get yelled at by my wife. What role do you think this this feminization of our culture is going to have as a lagging problem that goes into a without rule of law situation? 
Well, I think it's going to be a very short-lived problem because <laughs> what you have there is a whole demographic full of victims. Yeah. That's all, you, that's all they're going to be because what's going to happen is they're going to be victimized and then hopefully they smarten up after that. It's, you know, like uh, there's a couple dozen, dozen analogies I could tell you, but nobody likes guns until a gun is needed to save their life. Uh, nobody likes the police until they have to call the police to have the police show up to huh. protect them from sure. something else. It's just, it's, it's human nature. But what's going to happen is they're going to wake up and go, oh my God, this is not, this is not a civilized world anymore. So those, those civilized rules go out the window. And you're 100% correct about what you're saying, the demasculization of men. You know, it's more in metropolitan areas than it is in rural and country. Uh, right. Those are the areas that are going to have the biggest, biggest problems because the criminals are going to prey on them unmercifully and it's going to be it's going to be chaos well and and just to, and i and I, this for some reason i'm just thinking really globally <clears throat> in all of this this is where i'm like that that whole the rule of law thing that whole playing by the rules thing you know if i'm going to punch somebody i only do it to their face i'm not gonna you know <laughs> All of that goes out the window. When you're fighting, when you're in a fight for your life, for your resources, for your family, those rules go out the window. And the criminals, the gangs, those who will take over, all they will do is completely, they're already there. They're already at the rules are gone. We have no law of order. We get to go maraud. The rest of us who are law abiding need to realize the rules are gone. So you need to, you need to fight Absolutely. the fight, same fight, right? And we only have like the 10 rule- seconds. The rule of law is a social contract between the citizens, the government, and everybody else. We all agree that these laws, okay, you, we make the laws, and we all going to uh, abide by the laws. Until Once there's no the law. Once the law enforcement is gone, there is nobody to enforce those laws, so all the rules mean nothing. They mean absolutely nothing. If they and Roy, enforced. we have to, I'm sorry, we have to interrupt. We're going to go into the after show and answer Patreon's questions. What a great note to end on. Thank you, Roy, for being on the show. My pleasure. You've been listening to Prepping 2.0 with authors Shelby Gallagher and Glenn Tate. All of the fun and easy prepping information heard on this podcast can be found online at prepping2-0.com. You can also find out more about Glenn's books online at 299days.com and about Shelby's books online at agreatstate.com. Until next time, be smart, be safe, and be prepared. Be prepared.